It's live and in color with Wolfie D. Hi, everybody. This is Mark Lorenz from World Class Championship Wrestling and Championship Sports out of the great Dallas-Fort Worth area from the 1980s. Excited to be with you for this podcast. Hey, this is Jimmy Street, host of the Live and in Color with Wolfie D podcast. Hear the life and times of professional wrestler Wolfie D. From his time in the territories with PG-13, to his time in WWE, ECW, WCW, TNA, and more. Nothing is off limits and nothing will be held back. Thanks again for tuning in. Here he is, Wolfie D. Hey guys, welcome, welcome, welcome once again to Live and in Color with Wolfie D and my man Jimmy across the street. And today we have a very special guest, as always, uh, Mark Lorenz, the voice of world class championship wrestling. And Jimmy, we know with the Iron Claw being still, you know, I think in theater still, uh, maybe uh, just streaming for a price. Um, but that's going to be something we definitely want to talk about with oh, Mark. Yeah. Yeah, That's yeah, because yeah, I mean, because I don't even think they cast his role in the movie, you know. And uh, I, I've, I've looked; I know they had a Bill Mercer, and obviously, you know, it's kind of arguable. Like, is he the voice or is Mark Lawrence? I mean, they're both kind of the voice. It's like you can't really say one is is above the other. It's almost like Mean Gene or you know Howard Finkel or something. Yeah. You know, it's like hard to say. But anyway, what I mean by that is, I don't know. Mean Gene wins that one. Yeah, Mean Gene does win that one. You're right. So anyway, but what I'm saying to that effect, uh, you know, is I, I, I've this voice, his voice. I mean, if you just think about those old promos that Bruiser Brody was cutting, or Ric Flair, or Ed Carey, and the the, the rest of the Von Erich boys, you know, Mark Lawrence was right there. To, oh, I can't even do it, but it's just that <laughs> it's just that original voice. You know, it's like the yeah. Lance Russell voice. You yeah, know? man, for sure, man. That's what makes a great announcer, and then also obviously their their content and everything but oh uh, totally yeah there's a you know some people have just like that special voice you know that you can't you can't miss yeah and it just takes you back to a time that that you know puts you in a good spot in your mind you know and i yeah. think that's i think that's all what this whole show will be like so and uh we got to thank our buddy captain nick Absolutely. Captain Corner Nick is coming through for us big time. You know, we started this co-sponsorship deal where he would come on and, and sponsor the guest and everything. And man, it's been fun. We started it way back with like Kevin Sullivan and stuff. And and, yeah. we've, and we've continued it on. And then now we had Al Perez, which was an amazing show. Yeah. And now we got Mark Lawrence. And I think there's more to come, y'all. So, you know, yeah. and we're, you were also open to working with other folks, too. So just let yeah. us know. Yeah, for sure, man. We <laughs> Well, the little man needs to help each other sometimes, you know? Definitely. Definitely. We're all <laughs> climbing the same ladder, right? Yeah. Some <laughs> yeah. people climb the ladder and then pull it up so nobody else can get on it. <laughs> yeah. I, they pull it in the window in with them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We don't we do not do that around these parts, you know? So, yeah, yeah. man. So, uh, <laughs> let's get that voice on the line and let's talk a little world class. All right. I love it. We'll be right back after these messages. Hey, folks, to get your official Live It In Color with Wolfie D merchandise, go to ProWrestlingTees.com forward slash Live Wolfie D. Check it out. If you're listening to Live It In Color with Wolfie D on Apple Podcast and like what you're hearing, go ahead and leave a five-star rating. And while you're at it, write a review. Tell us what you liked. Tell us what you'd like to hear in the future. It's very important to us and always appreciated. Thanks again. All right, guys, we're back. And uh, per usual, we've got a very special guest today. He is the voice of world-class championship wrestling. He knows a lot about a lot of things. We're talking Freebirds, Von Erichs. Oh, man, we've got so much to cover here. Bruiser Jim. Brody. This awesome. Yeah. Yes, this is going to be <laughs> awesome. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce you to Mr. Mark Lorenz. Sir, it is an absolute pleasure to have you on here. Um, you've got so much to tell, and I can't wait to dig into it. Well, it's great to be with you. Appreciate you giving me a shout and hello to everybody that's listening. Yes, sir. And uh, I, I want to I want to go ahead and take down the elephant in the room, uh, the Iron Claw. Uh, I know me and Jimmy have have not watched it yet, but have you? And what were your thoughts, if you have? 
No, I have not. Uh, there's kind of been a little bit of a bad taste uh, with me and a bunch of the people who were around in the day. Yeah. Uh, in the fact that the producers never really wanted to consult with us or involve us in telling uh, the facts. Mm. And we're concerned that it's more of a producer-related fantasy. They've got some things that are accurate. But everybody I've talked to says there's a lot that's not really right. Yeah. And so I've had a hard time. Now, I did have a group of guys uh, where I work want to get together and go, and that never materialized. So I do hope at some point to see it because now, you know, it may be online rather than in a theater. But I have not seen it so far. I've seen a lot of the promos, a lot of the highlights, and talked to some people who've been, but I haven't seen it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to knock that out right off the bat because I know the listeners are probably like, you know, what does he think about it and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, and I've heard the same things. Uh, me and Jimmy have asked. We had Al Perez on. We've had a few people that you know have have been there and uh, you know lived it. And so I just wanted to see what your thoughts on it were. And uh, yeah, it's kind of the same take. Every, some people are saying it's great. Some people are saying it's not. Uh, so, yeah, kind of a. I, I, I wish that it would have been. I, I, even though I haven't seen it, I wish it would have been more from what I'm hearing. Yes, I do too. There were some neat possibilities there. Yeah. Uh, and I am I am very selfish and egotistical in stating this, but it's, <laughs> it's a fun thought. Uh, I have a 26 year old son. My oldest son is a theater and drama guy. He's living in New York. He loves it there. Yeah. And he looks an awful lot like I did man. back in the 80s. Uh, the facial features, the hair. And he says, Dad, they should have let me play you, and they wouldn't have known the difference. <laughs> and, uh, and he's right. But there were just so many possibilities that were missed mm. by not working with us who were all a part of it in that day. Yeah, that's, that's uh, unfortunate. I mean, honestly, that movie is a layup. That story, the Von Erich story, you, Wolfie, and I, we could write that movie and have it perfect. And um, honestly, it could be like a trilogy type deal where you could tell the whole world class story. That documentary that the WWE put out a few years back, that was so much better than what I'm hearing about this movie. And I just can't believe they they fumbled it and to hear even kevin talk about it that he didn't talk to kevin much and that just blows my mind you know yeah that that blows my mind too and uh for all of us who knew fritz von eric uh jack atkinson he had his strengths and his weaknesses just like we all do but yeah. he was not a bad person he was not abusive uh, you know, he came from an abusive background, so he was rough and tough, but he had a good heart. He treated all of us really well. And I always want to make sure that Fritz is portrayed factually mm. rather than as a villain and, and a reason behind so many of the problems. Yeah. Mm. That's, That's exactly what Al said, right, Wolfie? Yeah, yeah. And and, and, and another one, uh, like my t- top off questions here to start this, like, how did, how did, were you a wrestling fan? Because uh, I know that you were like a, a media guy or whatever, and they kind of put you in that. So were you a wrestling fan before you got into announcing for wrestling? No, not at all. I <laughs> mean, you could not have found anyone any greener. Uh, <laughs> I, I was fascinated with the fact that Bill Mercer was doing the wrestling TV. Mm -hmm. Uh, Bill had been the Texas Rangers first broadcaster. He had grandfathered into that job from being the minor league announcer with the Dallas Fort Worth Spurs for several years, which preceded the senators moving from Washington to Arlington. Mm -hmm. And Bill had a great record. He had been in as a young reporter on the assassination of president Kennedy in Dallas uh, in the sixties. He had done the Cowboys. Uh, he had he'd had a great career, and I was fascinated by Bill because Bill got frustrated with the salary that the Rangers were paying him because the Rangers didn't have the broadcasting rights the first few years. They were owned by the city of Arlington. 
Okay. Because the city of Arlington, you know, owned the stadium. Mm. And Bob Short and his group of investors had brought the team in. Well, with the city owning the broadcast rights, they couldn't pay as big a salary. And the guy with the city kept saying, Bill, be patient with us. We'll grow into it or it will sell to the team. But Bill didn't. And Bill took a job in Chicago as the number two guy with the Chicago White Sox Mm -hmm. when Bill Vec owned the White Sox. And Bill Vec could have been a wrestling promoter himself. He was very innovative. He Mm -hmm. colored outside the lines. You all may remember the disco demolition night. Yeah, I do. Yeah. And Harry Carey was brought in. He'd gotten in trouble in St. Louis with, uh, he had the accusation that he'd had an affair with one of the younger women of the Bush family. Oh, <laughs> and the, the great, the great gimmick on that. He should have been arresting too. He said, I will not deny nor confirm the rumors <laughs> because here I am in my forties with this gorgeous young heiress of the Bush family <laughs> oh my and the whole rumor is so flattering and complimentary I wouldn't dare deny it <laughs> so, that, that awesome. was the saga that Bill went into in Chicago and, and Bill didn't like Harry, thought he was an egotist thought he was unprofessional thought he was vulgar, but what he didn't realize is he and Beck were great friends and he was perfect in that 1970s White Sox environment yeah, And yeah. Bill got frustrated and began circulating that he thought that Harry Carey was going to get the ax at wow. the end of whatever it was, the 74 season or the 75 season. Mm-hmm. And uh, Harry got wind of that. And Harry summoned all the writers after a game one night. Uh, I think they were in one of the eastern cities, Detroit or Boston. And in those days before the internet, the writers were all in the bars after the game with the players, you know, getting the stories, getting the scoop. And Harry and his big demonstrative uh, personality Mm -hmm. just hollers across the room. Of course, he was probably, you know, drunk or at least on the way. (laughs) Hey, Mercer. And of course, a hush falls all over the room. Mm -hmm. And in those days, a pay telephone call cost a dime. (laughs) <laughs> and he put a dime on his thumb and put it up against the index finger and flipped it across the room at Bill Mercer <laughs> and said, Hey, next time I'm going to get fired, would you at least give me a call, pal? <laughs> and of course, that made the headlines. And a week or so later, Bill Mercer had been fired in Chicago. All right. wow. And so he came, he came back to Dallas. And landed the wrestling gig because Fritz had known him. Fritz had known his great history Mm. and thought he would bring a major league persona to the TV broadcast for then, you know, just Saturday night wrestling or main event wrestling. So my only curiosity was to flip it on to see Bill Mercer. And, you know, I thought, well, it's just kind of sad that this has happened. Mm. But Bill did a great job and he had done some wrestling in his younger years in Oklahoma. So my only knowledge was Bill Mercer. Okay. And then I get that call from Steve Harms, who was a friend or an acquaintance of Fritz, who had helped them with some uh, experimental work with what would be the world-class syndicated show years later. Mm -hmm. And he said, Mark, there's a PA job open in the area. And I thought, gee, Texas Rangers, Dallas Mavericks, Dallas Cowboys, (laughs) this is great. (laughs) And he said, well, Fritz Von Erich is going to call you. And I thought, well, hell. I don't know anything about wrestling. I don't want to do that. But I thanked him graciously and thought, well, if the guy calls me here in a week or so, I'll be ready just to say thanks, but no thanks. Well, it wasn't five minutes before my phone rang. And here's this imposing voice telling me he's Fritz on air. And he tells me he needs me for three weeks. Uh, Wrestling in Dallas before they started the syndicated show was on Sunday night. And then Monday night, they taped the TV at Will Rogers Coliseum in Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. And the way it was going to work, he needed me on a Monday and a Sunday, a Monday and a Sunday, a Monday and a Sunday for three weeks. And I was replacing some guy he had that was going to Europe to sing. Well, the money was good. Fritz was nice. He was complimentary. And for three weeks, what was I going to do if I didn't do it? (laughs) So I agreed to go. And they at that point, you were just you were just doing the ring announcing, not the commentary. Right. right? I, I was the PA guy promoting right. next week's card, 
uh, promoted the promotions, introduced the wrestlers, called the time, announced right. the winner, okay. uh, that sort of thing. Right. And so they had to tell me who the wrestlers were. I mean, everybody, including yeah. Kevin and Kerry Von Eric and David, they'd tell me who they were. Yeah. But they liked my work. They were complimentary. They were honest. They paid in uh, full on the spot. And after that last Sunday night, I went into Ed Watt there at the Sportatorium mm -hmm. and said, thank you. And if you ever need me again, please give me a call. I'll be glad to come help. It's been a great experience. And they were very complimentary and very gracious and very nice. And I went on my way. Mm -hmm. That was on a Sunday night. The very next night, I was at my parents' house. Because mind you, uh, I was cramming a four-year undergraduate program at TCU in the four and a half years. Mm. So I was in the summer before I was going to have to go back for that extra semester. Okay. Because I had changed my major halfway through and it was that summer I was out of school and I'm at my parents house for dinner and the landline phone rings about six o'clock in the evening and mm. it's Kathleen D white Fritz von Erich's personal secretary and secretary for the promotion okay. saying we're looking for Mark Lawrence that has helped at Southwest sports for the last three weeks and that was the legal name of the promotion then mm -hmm. on the checks and my mother said, well, he's right here. I'll uh, put him on. So, you know, talk about the smile of God or a coincidence, whatever it was. <laughs> I go to the phone and she says, Mark, there's been a mistake. Uh, you're needed at Will Rogers Coliseum tonight. Hmm. Well, I quickly ate the dinner my mother had prepared, went home. <laughs> I live close to the building, put on a coat and tie. I got there about 730 for the eight o'clock show. And I never heard what happened to the guy that went to Europe. I didn't know if Fritz liked me better or if he never came back mm -hmm. or if he was already gone and Fritz hired me for three weeks just as a trial in case I didn't work out. But that was it. I was the guy. Uh, and that's how it all started. Wow. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And so uh, th my next question would be, okay, so you, you, you did that and then you also did like the interviews with the guys. And then you you fall into commentary. How hard, as a person that didn't know wrestling, was it to? I, I don't think like interviewing the guys was very hard, but like calling matches and learning the names of moves and all that. I like to hear that experience. Well, I did the ring announcing only probably for the first year max, anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, Bill Mercer was doing the TV. It was just one guy. You didn't have a color guy, right? And uh, Bill was active with what was then North Texas State University. It's now called the University of North Texas. He did their football. He did their basketball. And he got on their faculty teaching broadcasting uh, to undergraduate students. So mm. he was really in up there, and that was a great thing for Bill. But that means he had to miss some Monday nights, mm -hmm. uh, especially if there was a basketball game. Because I started in June – uh, and by the time we got into January of the following year, Bill was missing about once a month mm. and he was bringing in a guy that he knew who, uh, was a backup sports guy for one of the, uh, network affiliates here, who was a great guy, just as good as gold, but he didn't know any more about wrestling than I did. <laughs> and he was very slow and there were long pregnant pauses and no <laughs> excitement and I could tell the promoters and the wrestlers just dreaded when the guy came in. Yeah. And I was learning. Uh, I had learned the talent by then. I had worked a rapport with the talent and with the promoters. Mm -hmm. We had a nice relationship. And on my nerve one night, without even giving it much thought, Fritz was still somewhat active. And he was at Will Rogers on Monday night. And I just blindsided him and walked up like an arrogant son of a gun and said, Fritz, <laughs> Bill is out a lot with his basketball. And I know that I won't call the guy's name. He's a great guy, but how about giving me a shot at the television? 
Mm. And Fritz put his arm around me and said words that I can't say here on a public forum. <laughs> uh, but I, I'll, I'll abbreviate it by saying, G.D. Mark, you've been reading my mind. You're so damn good. <laughs> in the room. And he walks in uh, to Gary Hart, the booker, Bronco Lubitsch, laying out the show because Bill was there that night. Yeah. And he said, uh, Mark's going to do color with Bill tonight. We're going to try him out on TV. And so I went out and did color on a couple of matches with Bill Mercer, which was very exciting. Mm -hmm. And uh, the very next week, Bill was going to be out for a basketball game, and I got the nod that I was the TV guy. Wow. wow. And I was as nervous as Armand Hussein used to say, as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rockets. <laughs> <laughs> but got out on the set and made it happen, and I asked for a lot of help with the holes. Yeah. And, you know, when you're the one-man guy, you have to promote the upcoming cards, you have to narrate the match, yeah. you have to tell the story. So, you know, I didn't have to know everything right away. I could get by just with enthusiasm. Yeah. And uh, they were they were really pleased. And so I became the backup TV guy. And then the syndicated show behind the scenes that had been developed with Fritz and Mickey Grant and Bill Mercer was coming to reality. And about year two, two and a half in, uh, they gave Bill the syndicated show and I became the host then of Channel 11. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, awesome. Let me uh, ask this. Okay, so and I love this green guy conversation. I love this part because I mean I know how it feels, obviously, and then uh, I've seen things go good and things go bad with that. But as an interviewer, okay, so you've interviewed some of the best. You've stood there while like Ric Flair, Bruiser Brody, all these guys are giving these great promos and whatnot. In those early days, was there was there something that you were like? holy crap, man, this dude is insane or, you know, he's going to kill me or anything like that. Like what was going through your mind at those early stages where you really didn't get it yet? And you had these guys doing all these crazy promos with you standing there. Well, we were far enough in by the time I took over TV, uh, even as Bill's backup that I developed a rapport with the guys. And mm, okay. I, I, I knew they were great guys. They were fun. Most of them were. They all had their own personalities. Yeah. And then we would sit down and have a production meeting before we started. Yeah. So I knew what they needed to get across, and I needed to help them get that across. So I was so focused on accomplishing the goal of the interview that I didn't mind their theatrics unless it tickled me. And if <laughs> I started to giggle or laugh, <laughs> I had to kind of turn my back to the camera and keep the mic up in front of them. <laughs> so, uh, okay, hang on, hang on, hang on. So that's that's funny to me because yeah, breaking character is one thing. So, like, who who made you have to turn your back? Oh, Armand Hussein had me from the first night. Uh, <laughs> he was one of my favorites. We went out and ate barbecue together. He was a comedic genius who should have gone to Hollywood. <laughs> uh, his wrestling skills in the ring were mid-level card at best, yeah. but his managerial talents, ringside escapades, yeah. interview prowess and personality, it wasn't anybody any better, but he had me and he knew he had me and I would get tickled just when he walked onto the set by the way he looked <laughs> at me and he, he would blame me for everything that went wrong. <laughs> and he always could outpace me when he knew I was ready to say something. And I just love the guy. And we lost him here just several years ago. Yeah. Wonderful guy. And uh, another story about Hussein is when, when the doctors would come into Dallas. In those days, the state of Texas regulated uh, the wrestling just like boxing. And all the wrestlers yeah. had to have a physical before they, they worked. Right. And we had the same doctor in Fort Worth every Monday night. We all knew him. He was a friend of Fred's. But in Dallas, we had a rotation. And every time there was a new doctor, Hussein would come in and feign this agony. Doctor, you've got to help me, doctor. I'm a sick man, doctor. You've got to <laughs> give me something. You've got to prescribe something. They would just throw these doctors who were so professional and when they would finally get around to asking me what was wrong, he would give this, and I've got to clean this up. 
<laughs> this layman's description of erectile dysfunction, <laughs> and it was just absolutely hilarious. Everybody <laughs> through the building would laugh, you know, because these doctors are so serious about everything. But he's the one that got me, and I love Gino Hernandez. We had fun. I actually did better interviews when I didn't care for the person I was interviewing because they wouldn't suck me in. Yeah. Uh, but but it was great fun. Of course, you've got the crowd responding, and uh, I wanted to come across like Bill did, have a little sophistication without being stuffy and arrogant. So right. I could make some comebacks, you know, and yeah. uh, it, it just worked well and was great fun. And you just, you fell in love with it after that. I mean, as a person that was a non-wrestling fan, you get in and you, you succeed at it and you just fell in love with it. Well, it, you know, it gets in your blood. There's nothing else oh, in yeah. the world like uh, professional wrestling in America. No. No. And the Dallas office did it so well. Uh, they use the word shoot, you know, for the rough nature of it. Yeah. Right. And uh, when they when they developed that syndicated show and brought in the apron cameras, instant replay, slow yeah. motion, there was no room uh, for error. You right. had to look it in and mm-hmm. the perspiration had to fly and huh. you had to hear the pops and the hits. And when they did that Channel 11 up their show, too, and they went to an apron camera and did some things which they had never done before. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, the product quality was so incredible for its day that you couldn't help but fall in love with it. Yeah. And y'all were, uh, man, y'all were drawing huge houses, uh, stadium shows, all that stuff. Um, what was the pay like back then? And I'm not, I'm not asking you to give numbers, but I know everybody's making money. I mean, as an announcer, were they taking care of you? Well, for the day. Now, we're talking 1980s money yeah uh, for a young kid in his 20s mm-hmm. the hockey team before i ever did wrestling paid me 25 dollars a night to be the house announcer right and that day fritz called me and offered me the three-week trial it was 35 or 70 bucks for the two times right. well you know for a young kid that's not great money but it wasn't bad yeah right but then right. before i know it they were proud of me they up to, to 50 a night in each mm. place and so just the fact that you're rewarded without asking is helpful. Yeah. And then when I started TV, it went, uh, it was immediately paid a hundred dollar bill. And uh, that's what I got for doing the TCU football game. I did TCU football and basketball and they paid, I think 50 for basketball and a hundred for football. So wrestling TV paid a hundred, but as the thing took off, the hour long channel 11 show that I was hosting expanded to an hour and a half. And then later it expanded to two hours. Mm. In addition to these big live houses, they were drawing their ratings were skyrocketing. Yeah. Uh, they were the highest rated show that channel 11 had. They were going up on the satellite. Is, is channel 11, to- is channel 11, the, uh, someone told me this, uh, uh, that there was a religious channel that y'all were on. And that the religious channel, the best show on the religious channel was wrestling. Is that there any truth to that? Well, that's true, but that's channel 39 out of Dallas. It was the okay. production home for the syndicated show. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. My show, we taped on Monday, it showed on Saturday night, uh, and that's on KTVT. It was the independent station that went up on the satellite, kind of like WTBS in Atlanta, right. and WG in okay. Chicago. But, you know, Fritz raised me to 125, then it was 150, then it jumped to 200 a show. Uh, the, inter- the interview sessions in Dallas, where we would block the syndicated tapes with the interviews for all the towns that he went to, we'd be there for hours. Yeah. Uh, it paid, you know, a little bit. And so, you know, for a young guy, I was doing pretty well, I thought. Yeah. Yeah, that- no doubt. Sounds pretty good. So we do this thing where I, I do a, a forward roll and I jump and I tag Jimmy 
<laughs> I'm, I'm hot tagging you in, bro. I'm coming in hot. All right. Yeah. So I don't know. There's got to be some kind of science to this. And, and it may be as simple as just it gave me good memories. But there is such a nostalgia to me based around wrestling voices. OK, obviously, you've got like Hulk Hogan, Macho Man, Ric Flair. But I even go so far as the announcers, you know, Lance Russell, Bob Cottle, and of course, Bill Mercer. But you are one of those voices for me. And when you did that intro for us, I had chills all over my body because it reminded me of watching you as a kid and watching you, you know, all watching all of you as a kid. Has has that been something that you've heard a lot over the years of, wow, your voice, it just takes me back? Have you, I'm sure you've heard that quite a bit. Yes, I hear some of that. Uh, it has actually re-emerged in the last few years more than it did for a while, but it's always been there. Yeah. Uh, I went, I declared for the ministry, went to seminary and the wrestling deal, you know, was the perfect way to work my way through school. Yeah. Uh, and then in, in, I guess it was 90, I retired by then Jared had the promotion, but I had been out for about five years and, uh, took my dad to a ranger game at the ballpark in Arlington, which was new. Yeah, And yeah. about the fifth inning, I got up and went down the stairs and turned down the portal ramp to go to the restroom. It's fifth or sixth inning. Yeah. And made a U-turn to go into the men's room. And this guy was standing across the big concourse up there in the upper level. And he just eyes me from head to toe as I go into the restroom. <laughs> and when I come out, he's out there eyeing me again. And he, he points at me and says, it's you. I knew it was you. You're the wrestling guy. Oh, man, I can't believe it. You're Mark Lawrence. You're just great on there. Man, the Von Erics and the Freebirds, we watched you every, you know, I'm looking around to see if anybody's watching and <laughs> my chest bulging a little bit. And finally, after all these accolades, he looks at me and he says, hey, man, what are you doing now? And with all this pride and delight, I said, well, friend, I'm a United Methodist minister now pastoring a church. <laughs> and he said, oh, no, oh, shit, man, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> Pastor, you can't cuss. <laughs> that voice, I say, yeah. uh, that world never, I could never escape it and didn't need to or want to. So it's a right. blessing. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it just something about your voice is just so, I don't know, it's comforting to me. And, and, and I know Bill, you know, and how's he doing? I think, is he 98 now? He would be about that age. Uh, yeah. I have not talked to Bill since I finished parish ministry here about three and a half years ago. I've got his number in one of my old date books, which we don't use anymore with iPhones. Right. <laughs> uh, the last time I talked to him, we had a great visit. He had, had to give up his guest appearance with the Round Rock Express minor league baseball team in suburban Austin yeah. because he said, I can't see the ball in the outfield anymore. Mm. Uh, but Bill's a wonderful guy, and that's about how old he would be. Yeah, Bob, I know Bob's close to that age, Bob Cottle, and I know Bill was close to that age. And it's just amazing that those guys, I'm, I'm so happy they're still around with us, and I hope they're healthy and, and, and everything's going good for them as much as, you know, being almost 100 can, can make you, you know, so. Yeah. <laughs> Let's take a quick time out and get a word from one of my dope ass sponsors. And we'll be right back with more live and in color with Wolfie D. This is Nick from Captain's Corner, and I'm here to tell you about an amazing event that's happening on Saturday, April 20th in Orlando. That event is called Glory Days, and it takes place at the Rosen Center, which is right off International Drive. The Rosen Center has an assortment of restaurants, and on April 20th, it will hold dozens of international wrestling stars for what should be an unforgettable day. The lineup includes Ron Simmons, Stan Hansen, Larry Zabisco, Kimberly Page, Matt Riddle, Devon Dudley and many others. One of the featured events at Glory Days is a world-class championship wrestling panel that will feature discussion on the Von Erichs, the Iron Claw movie, the Sportorium, and so much more by the people that lived it, including the One Man Gang, Al Perez, Missy Hyatt, and more. Tickets are available now, and they are as low as $30. 
head on over to Eventbrite and type in Glory Days. Hope to see everyone in Orlando for Glory Days on April 20th. So being a, a minister, uh, I feel, I may be wrong, but I feel like you were probably always in uh, religion and stuff, very strong in your faith. Uh, how is that being in world-class championship wrestling uh, when, I mean, we know the stories about Devon Ericks and, and the Freebirds and, and everybody else. And I'm, I'm not I'm not knocking and I don't want you to knock anyone. I'm just saying how being a Christian, and if I'm wrong, you tell me, you might have, you might have found Christianity afterwards, but I feel like you probably had it before. So how was that being involved with wrestling, which is obviously known for some dark uh, times? (laughs) Well, I mean, religion has its dark times and dark personalities too. Yeah. Uh, Everybody does every line of work. Yeah, uh, I saw it as a as a neat opportunity. I mean, who else on planet Earth can boast the journey that I've had? I mean, uh, hardly anyone. Yeah, I I knew those guys. Even when they colored outside the lines, they were still good people. Oh, right. And uh, they had their vulnerabilities like anything else. So I never really had any problem with it, and uh, uh, I just saw it as as the progress of life. And a unique opportunity to learn life and people. But think of what I learned from that. I mean, seminary taught me theology. Right. Wrestling taught me life and people and human need and relationships and where grace is and how to comfort people in the valley of the shadow of death and tragedy. And I just wouldn't take for those years. Oh, man. That's awesome. Yeah. I love it. that You say it like that as a pastor. I really do. Yeah, so Gary Hart, to me, you know, Wolfie can (laughs) attest to this. (laughs) Gary is easily my favorite manager of all time. I I did a small foot in the business and imitated Gary as much as possible with my style as a manager. But to me, Gary was on par with all of the greats. And even as a booker and his promos, he was always awesome. Can you tell me some Gary Hart stories? Well, Something that I found and admired and respected in Gary that he ex- explained to me is that anybody can go out there and yell and scream. And most of the guys yell and scream. Yeah. But there is a place for the understated, more subtle, more sophisticated, if not devious, underhanded, nonverbal quality. Mm-hmm. that speaks to people and gets heat uh, in a more diabolical way than yelling and screaming does. Now, Gary knew when to yell and scream. He knew when to be passionate, but he also knew how to be tactical, uh, to use psychology, to use innuendo. He yeah. knew how to be subtle. And I had great respect for him. And so I, I'm right with you and uh, how great he was. And uh, he, he didn't get all the credit he deserved as Booker. Uh, we had him for two times as Booker. And the first time, there was a little bit of proselyting or undermining uh, by the guy who followed him, who also was a good guy and did a great job. Who was but, that? Uh, Mantell? And Mantell, yes. Yeah. But Gary, Gary was great. He, he loved the business. He lived the business. He knew the business. He had such respect for the business. Yeah. yeah. And uh, if you didn't respect what was going on, you'd have Gary in your face pretty fast. <laughs> you love that jimmy you love i that. do i'm popping so much yeah hey yeah. so it also you saved uh someone's life from getting their throat hurt or was that a work well i think you already know the answer to that <laughs> well uh, i just listen i read it on wikipedia and <laughs> and honestly this is this is me like i said i, I broke into the business in 1989 1990 I was 15 years old, so I didn't get a lot of, uh, you know, world class in Nashville where I lived. So I don't know these stories. uh, So I'd like to hear from you. I guess I guess it was a work by the way you say it. Well, 
Fritz had this ethic, and this goes back to him liking Bill Mercer and feeling Bill would bring major league credibility to the TV. Mm -hmm. Monday Night Football was the thing back in these days. Howard Cosell, Frank Gifford, and Don Merrick were the three guys. Uh, They were, you know, institutions in American sports uh, lives in those days. And they wore the monogram yellow ABC jackets. Mm. And Fritz knew how respected they were. And, of course, those three had a little gimmick, you know, Howard Cosell, who could be a pretty good heel at times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but run, monkey, run. Fritz, <laughs> Fritz wanted fans to regard Bill and I the way they did the announcers on Monday Night Football. Yeah. And his ethic was, if they respect you and they trust what you are saying, yeah. they will buy the product. For sure. So as a result, Fritz had a hard and fast rule. The announcer never gets in the fray. You Mm. don't touch him. You don't rough him up. uh, You don't belittle him. You make your case as a heel or a baby face, but you respect the announcer. Right. Now, heels are going to talk down to you, but they knew how to do it. Right. Well, that had always been the ethic. So when the deal came up in whatever year it was with David Manning, who was uh, a great promoter and did booking as well, very acrobatic and wiry guy. He wasn't real tall, uh, but he could take a bump, you know, as well as anybody. Yeah. The deal was Air, uh, David would get himself twisted. He would literally pull the middle rope over around his head right? Uh, where he is you know, in a position of being trapped by the two ropes. Right, right. And my job, they would do it right in front of the TV table. My job was to get up on the table and up on the apron and grab his ankles and turn him up through the air, flipping him out and releasing him from the ropes. Yeah. Well, for Mark Lowrance to come up from the table and do that after all that epic of not involved, you know, yeah, it just, gave it great uh, credibility, and, and it sold very, very well. Yes, yes, I can see that. And I, I I actually don't know the moment, but I just read it, and I was like, okay, is this a pseudo work? And I figured I'd throw that in there. Uh, because, I mean, there are things that happen in the ring sometimes, man. I've, <laughs> a couple of times I've uh, legitimately almost died because a guy – was a goof and uh threw a you remember those uh little photograph containers the little film canisters yeah little film canisters this guy when i was like 17 he put powder in that and then he's supposed to hit the ring i've got the i've got the uh bret hart move on him this uh the the sharpshooter yeah the sharpshooter i was fixed to say scorpion deathlock i don't know which okay Yeah, anyway, you know. I got that on the guy, and and I'm 17 years old, and this guy comes in. We he put his powder in that little thing. He didn't pour it in his hand and throw it at me. He just shot it out of the cannon, and <laughs> so this little bullet comes into my mouth while I'm blowed up, and I breathe in, <gasps> and that baby powder went down my throat, and I was I, I really thought I was about to die, and thank God I puked in the ring. And uh, the guy pinned me. So, yeah, you never know sometimes whether it's a shoot or a work. <laughs> well, there were several times when we were either doing something in the ring uh, as an interview or off uh, to the side. Uh, we'd be off to the side in Fort Worth. In fact, when it was hockey season, we'd be in the uh, penalty box from the old hockey boards, you know, where they opened the door from the yeah. ice. Yeah. But there were several times where people uh, were drunk or whatever, and they would try to attack a wrestler. Yeah. And when we'd be together and I'd see him coming, uh, you know, Terry Gordon, whomever it was, I would drop the mic away from their face and say, behind you, Bam Bam, behind you, baby, you know, uh. you know whomever it was, so that they would immediately turn around and they could take care of themselves. Right, uh, right. And they were always so affectionately grateful for me giving them the heads up. Heck yeah. And to, <laughs> to do it in a way where the fans never heard it. Yeah. Because you had to think on your feet. Yeah. And uh, 
so that, you know, there were numerous times where I, I had to call a guy out on something that wasn't supposed to be, and they were always so gracious. That's, that's awesome, great. man. Uh, yeah, I've been in many of those situations. That's so that's so awesome uh, that you would do that for them. Um, well, you and- know, when you when you went to the smaller market areas uh, and relied on the local police <laughs> to be yeah, right? security, they they were all marks, you know, and they hated absolutely like fans. And so, you know, they were never really safe. So we had to look out for each other. Yeah. Yeah. yeah what yeah. was the worst uh, thing like that you've seen? Well, the worst thing I've ever seen happened uh, just two years ago. Uh, we had a promoter out of Oklahoma trying to start a little territory. He was off to a great start. We were at a building in, in Irving called the Southern Junction. It was nearly sold out, which would be, you know, a thousand or so people. So enough enough people in a flat roof building to have great energy. And uh, they were were doing something with a little guy that was going to be a job boy referee. And uh, the wrestler that I won't mention by name, he's got a pretty good YouTube presence uh, was the heel of the match. And he had never come in from his travel trailer that was outside the building. He was Mm. never in on the choreography, the production, the instructions, but he was to have a railroad spike and scrape it across the guy's head. And, Mm. uh, he came in drunk Mm. and got carried away. And he bludgeoned that guy with that spike and he hemorrhaged, uh, from the head I mean, we had blood spewing in the air. Uh, that who is this, Jim? Everything. <laughs> they had to save his life. Come on, Mark. Who is it? Who is it? In, in front of everybody. And uh, had to change the apron on the ring. That that was the worst thing. I never saw anything that bad in my years with the wow. promotion. Wow. Yeah, that is me and you. Wow, wow, wow. Are we Nick Nitrous now? <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. and we we had just had Jeff Jarrett the week before come back and make an appearance first time since his dad had owned the promotion, you know, in the late eighties. He and I yeah. did an interview that's on YouTube. Uh I hit him in the in the heart uh about helping put perspective on his separation from his dad and how he had oh, yeah. to do that, and I could love both of you, and all this, that, and the other. We had momentum until that hit. But yeah. people mm-hmm. walked out. They never came back. It demoralized the promoter, wow. and, you know, he ran out of money and went out of business. Well, let me ask you this. Okay, was so that we, we just went there. It was, uh, like I said, Jeff and Jerry have always been a part of my life, man. They gave me my first break. Uh, and then they, uh, they, they pushed me, uh, with TNA when I first changed my gimmick and stuff. So then we could talk about, you know, the bus trips, the Memphis guys going to Dallas and all that kind of stuff. What was that like? I think it was called the Renegade series or something like that. What was it called? Uh, Yeah. Yeah. The Renegade series. So talk about that and what the Jarrett's mean to you, Mark. I will, I will do that. But back to your question of who it was, you just mentioned the name, so I don't have to. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Okay. Fair enough. Back to the Jarrett. Uh, Jerry Jarrett came in, and Jeff was a really, I thought, striking, good-looking young man as he was starting his career. And uh, Jeff was very, very nice. Uh, I just thought this kid is too nice to be in this, you know, and Jerry was feeding him big five and six egg breakfast every morning just to get him <laughs> built up and everything. But Jerry brought great energy into the promotion. Uh, I had to start thinking about getting out in those years because by then I'd taken my first church and, and it's really hard to do TV wrestling and be a pastor. Oh man, I can't imagine. Especially in a main, in a mainline denomination. So I stayed with him as long as I could and gave my notice. Uh, but Jerry's world was different. Uh, the promotion was so down by the time he got there that everybody said, well, it's just so different. It's so different. Well, it had to be different. He brought in some Memphis talent. He combined what we have, but he brought new energy to it. Yeah. And Jerry was such a brilliant 
manipulator and promoter. <laughs> and we often use manipulation in a negative way, but anybody who's successful in life knows how to manipulate people and circumstances toward their goal. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And Jerry was a master manipulator. Now, I didn't see him, you know, screwing people and taking advantage of people. He just knew how to manipulate right. uh, to, to get what he wanted. His ethic, yeah. you know, was cessation of disbelief. Yeah. And uh, that's what motivated. Well, I just found great energy and delight with Jerry Jarrett and hated to have to, to give it up. In fact, he had Eric Embry call me 60 days after I retired and offered me anything I wanted to come back because they were losing their TV and, you know, had some struggles, but I just couldn't. Yeah. But uh, I reconnected with Jerry Jarrett back in 2018, went over and saw him in Memphis. Yeah. He'd been talking about me on the podcast. And we developed a series of programs on his Roku network called Wrestling With Life. Yeah, and yeah, used yeah. a lot of the footage from the Dallas days on life lessons, mm -hmm. uh, and and really did well with it. And uh, so that you know Jeff and I and Jerry all reconnected, and and we have a great relationship. And I I'm sad that we've lost Jerry. He was a great mind. Absolutely, man. Like I said, he gave me a break. Uh, I was at his funeral, saw a lot of guys that appreciated him uh, when we were there. You know what I mean? It was it was very cool. Yeah, no doubt. What about Eric Embry's booking? How would you feel about that? <laughs> well, Eric was very passionate. He was very cooperative. Uh, he was very enthusiastic. It was a tough sell because he had been a gender questionable heel. Right. And to turn around and become a babyface in Dallas, Texas in the 80s with the AIDS crisis and all the phobia, that wasn't easy to pull off. Right. Uh, but he did it pretty well. And his run with Matt Bourne, uh, issues with Akbar and the USWA, you know, tear the banner down. Eric did the best he could with what he had, and I developed great respect for him. And yeah. uh, I thought he did a good job. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. We had a couple of listener questions come in, and that was one of them. Thank you, Ben Martin, as always. But, yeah, that I, I'm just curious because I know downtown Bruno, and he's not the hugest fan of Eric Embry, but I think that was something more to do <laughs> with Embry's stance on Lawler and stuff. But, <laughs> yeah. So, it's always – after all the interviews you've done, stand there with somebody. Who do you think, Mark, is the is the best guy to stand up there and go, hey, and blast it and go? Well, Ric Flair, when he would come I knew he was going to say that. I knew he was going to say always, that. Always did great interviews. Yeah. Because he had such a professionalism about him, even as a heel. And whether or not he was talking to Lance Russell, Ken Resnick, Bill Mercer, Jim Ross, Paul Bosch, whomever it was, he always complimented them on being a great broadcast and wrestling professional. Yeah. Which just spoke of his respect for the business. Yeah. And then he always went on and got uh, the point across as well as anybody. Uh, Gino Hernandez was good. Michael Hayes was good. He had such passion for the business. Uh, you know, there were a lot of guys that were good. Often it was the heels who did better because the heels in many ways had more personality. Uh, you can be a baby face as a good wrestler and have a great body, but let's face it. Kerry Von Eric had a heart of gold, but he was a dud on the interview. <laughs> set. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but those heels, they were good. Bruiser was good. Uh, you know, just so many of them. What was yeah. it like interviewing Bruiser Brody? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was always a challenge because Bruce, part of Bruiser's gimmick was his odor. He his never what? washed the odor. His what? O -O -R, smell. Wow. <laughs> he never washed the garments he wrestled in. Wow. So the, the locker room smelled of Bruiser. The interview set smelled of Bruiser. That was part of his gimmick. So when he came out there, <laughs> and I love Bruiser as a person, Frank. Yes, yeah, great yeah. businessman, Everybody great does. wrestler, yeah. great father. Uh, but it was hard to stand there because he stunk so bad. You could smell him coming. 
Wow. And then my clothes would That's smell funny. bad for the rest of the evening. Oh, That's man. hilarious. But, but he was great. You know, of course, he spit a lot and spewed a lot. And uh, Bruiser was one of a kind. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. What's, the, what's the best match you ever called? Well, there were so many great ones. One I didn't call. It was Bill Mercer's match. I was the ring announcer. It was that cage door event yeah. at the Union Ring. Dallas in the early 80s where the Freebirds went heel and uh, that was very well done Yeah, certainly the world title Kerry winning that in 84 uh, that was such a thrill for me that was not a Channel 11 show that was a syndicated show but it was one of those times when Bill was out and I was his backup for that syndicated show and I got Texas Stadium that day so that was a great one <laughs> that's uh, awesome those, yeah. those uh, four man events and six man events with the Von Erics and the Freebirds, they had such energy, such chemistry. Yeah. And the passion from the crowd was so high before they ever even got to the ring. Yeah. That those were hard to beat. You That's the best thing. When the crowd is that high, it really doesn't take a lot after that. Yeah. Gino and Chris were so great as a tag team. And it didn't matter who they were against. They were just good. Uh, you know, so some great matches. Yeah, absolutely. What about when the Dingo Warrior came around? <laughs> well, Dingo looked great, as you know. Yeah. Uh, even with us, he just had a great body. And the face paint and everything. Uh, Jim Helwig did not have the personality and the rapport that most of the other heels did. Right, right. Uh, he was very aloof. He was somewhat withdrawn. Uh, I never developed a good relationship with him. And I approached him one time about his profane language uh, in front of children with us on that Christian broadcasting-based TV and, and just said, uh, Dingo, any of us can use language like that. But it takes somebody really sharp and articulate to say the same thing with the same passion without having to be profane. Yeah. And you'll do better in this environment if you'll give that some thought. Well, he, he flushed me down the commode with that and never made any adjustments. So I never approached him about anything again. Yeah. So Dingo wasn't with us all that long. He went on. He did great. I'm glad he did. Yeah. But I never had the relationship with him that I did with Michael Hayes, Gino Hernandez, and so many of the other great ones. Yeah. Well, hey, real quick, before we uh, before we end this up, you just said Michael Hayes, you said Gino Hernandez. Give us some positive things on those guys, because I, I know some of them, but I'd like to hear what you think. Well, Michael Hayes was like Gary Hart. They were very different personalities, but Michael was so into the business and so full of creativity and creative talent and creative input and passion. Uh, and he was so good on the interview set and so obnoxious when he <laughs> would shake his hair and wiggle his butt. Uh, yeah. He was just top shelf in everything they did. And those birds were so different from each other that they just contrasted and yet complemented each other. And it was just dynamite. Yeah, yeah, and that the Von Erichs versus the Freebirds were so much that it will never come back. There'll never be another angle to to compete with that. I, I remember, you know, and the devil has just emerged here at the Coliseum as the Freebirds have attacked the Von Erichs from the parking lot. <laughs> well, that all happened as that syndicated show hit it big and went worldwide, and that Von Erich Freebird feud forever change professional wrestling yeah oh you know, yeah so good so well done so believable so energized lasted so long and was so well packaged with that tv production and especially that good looking young announcer they had there was no way <laughs> who do you give who do you give the total credit to that to well you can't give credit to any one individual it was a team effort yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 you know, everybody involved should have gotten credit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah, I understand that. I've been involved in some good angles. Uh, not that good, but I just feel like there's, if everybody's into it, then it works, you know? And if you're having fun, it works. Well, had this promotion that this guy put together that I told you about earlier, had it gone anywhere, uh, I would have encouraged them to get Ross and Marshall involved and somehow Michael's still around have him get involved and have a new set of henchmen. It wouldn't have been the same, but it sure could have revived some great old times and helped yeah. build a, a new regional territory, which I think society is ready for again. I think they're missing that. Amen. Yeah. Amen. You know, you talk about giving credit to things, Wolf, and we got to give credit to our buddy, Captain Corner Nick. He put this together for us. You know, he's got these shows coming up at Glory Days, Grapple Con. I know you're going to have a Q&A there. The weekend of April 20th, Rosen Center, fabulous facility in the Orlando Disney World area. The site for this great event that you're ready to hear about. Yes. <laughs> Orlando, Florida, Heroes of the Sportatorium special Q&A. It's going to have One Man Gang, Missy Hyatt, Jack Victory, Brian Adius, and Al Perez. And it'll be all hosted by our guest today, Mark Lawrence. And it's going to be a lot of fun, but it's how cool is it to get out and see the people and do these things? Well, it's a lot of fun. I was just in Hollywood here a couple of weeks ago with uh, – uh, what's London's name that Paul London, it was with yeah. WWE and, uh, a guy out there named Zach Schaefer, who, uh, was the, the host of the, the, uh, video that we did. Great guys, bright guys. Uh, I've done the gathering in Charlotte. I've done fan fest in several locations. It's just fun. Yeah. It's great to be with the fans. I have more time to visit with them than I did when I was doing TV because you got a job to do then. Right. And so it's right. great fun. Yeah. Wolfie, did you have something else? I just want to ask you about one person that, uh, that we had on the show and I stole his move. And we talked about that, uh, me and him, Al Perez and his, uh, helicopter move where he would spin the person. Do you remember that move? Yeah, I word. vaguely remember him doing that. Yes. Yeah. And then me and Al talked about it and all this kind of stuff, and it was funny. I just don't know if you remembered that. Yeah, Al, uh, you talk about managers, and are they just really fixtures, or are they really managing the talent? Al really respected Gary Hart and listened oh, yeah. to him. Oh, and he said he did. And uh, learned a lot from him and had great respect yeah. for Gary. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That was awesome, man. And uh, after about 12 years in the business, I got bigger. You know, I, I could pick people up. Uh, you know, in my early career, I, you know, I was an arm drag guy. But when I went to TNA, I got bigger and I could pick people up and I started doing stuff like Al did. And so, yeah, I told yeah. him that. So I stole your move. And everybody's like, where'd you get that from? And I said, <laughs> Al Perez. <laughs> I stole it from him. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mark. It's been a pleasure to have you on, man. Absolutely, man. Thank you so much, Mark. Well, thanks for having me. Blessings to you. Blessing to the audience. And let's make some great wrestling happen in coming years. Yes. Right, we are back with Ask Wolfie D. Anything, and first of all, Mark Lawrence, man, <laughs> what an interesting yeah. dude, man. Very yeah. good stories, yeah. Loved it, man. That was it's it's so cool to see it from a different perspective too. You know, like I lived one perspective, and obviously talking to other wrestlers is kind of along that same line. But when you talk to, you know, people that weren't necessarily going to be in the wrestling business, and then as an right. announcer, oh, he's yeah. his whole his whole story is different, you know, totally. And I can never think of another bruiser Brody promo in a different sense. Now that I know that it came with an odor as well. Yeah. <laughs> can you imagine bro? Like, yeah, <laughs> I've never heard that before in my life. I think I'm, I'm serious. Have you ever heard that bruiser Brody had a bit of no, a stink, I have not. Stank I have not to him? 
Yeah. I, I've been in the ring with some people that did have, but uh, not, yeah. not, you know, Brody, I'm talking about they stunk with me, but sure. uh, in more ways than one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, so. that, that was crazy. I, I think that might be the, the jewel of the show, that story. I know that's weird, but man, I just yeah. never have heard that about Bridget Brody. But anyway, on to the rest of the show here with Ask Wolfie. Thanks again, Mark. Thanks again, Captain Corner Nick. You know, go support Captain's Corner. Follow him on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever they're on, and uh, make sure you're following his videos because he's having virtual signings all the time. So, He's got some cool people with him. So anyway, but the very first question today for Ask Wolfie D Anything is from One Winged Joker on YouTube. And he asked this question. He says, was the initial vision for the disciples of the new church any different from what was on screen? Okay, so there there really was never a, hey, get a phone call. Hey, we're going to put you, Jim Mitchell, Brian Lee. It was... Uh, I, I, if I remember correctly, it was just boom, we show up and, the, you know, Brian was there and Jim was there and it was just, you know, Jim had been with me for a minute, but then it was Brian and it was just like, uh, I, I, I was never part of any meeting that said, okay, we're, this is going to be called the new church and here's the direction we're going to go with it. I never was involved in anything like that. So okay. any talks of what the new church was going to be didn't involve uh, me. So um, just it, like I said, I've said this before, you know, we were only supposed to win those belts for uh, uh, when we, you know, me and Brian were only supposed to win them for one week. And so a lot of this, I felt like it was booked on the fly. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So it was like, kind of like, okay, we've got this collection of type people that can work together and let's just throw them together and see if it sticks. Kind of. Wow. I I really have no idea on that, man. I know that sounds crazy, but uh, you know, I've said it a hundred times. I just really wasn't in any kind of booking uh, talks or anything like that. It was just, you know, Hey, am I booked this week? (laughs) Yes or no. You know? Right, right, right. Yeah. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. So that that's, thank you for that question. Definitely appreciate that. And we will go to the next one here. So the very next one is from wild, the beast MF on YouTube. <laughs> and he said, yo, Wolfie, <laughs> I know. I, yeah. Yo, Wolfie, he's, he's in the character here. So <laughs> it would be awesome if you could compare the morale of the two locker rooms. How does the WWF locker room of your time compare to the TNA locker room of your time? Uh, well, obviously, uh, the WWF locker room was a lot bigger. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, you're talking uh, big venues, and and then you're talking about the fairgrounds, and everybody's cramped in that one little corner, basically. Um, the catering was different. You got the white trash cafe versus what WWF can afford. Um, <laughs> and as far as guys and the morale, uh, so I guess TNA being a upstart company at the time. You know, everybody's gung ho because everybody wants to to be kept and to be, you know, to get over in this new thing and wants it to work so they can uh, continue to work and get a payday. Um, and so, the WWF, you know, you got all these undertakers and all these people, you know, that have been in the business forever, and completely different, really. Um, uh, you know, but I guess I, I think more professional might be the thing, uh, whereas where TNA was more laid back. Uh, yeah. You know, WWF is, I mean, you're, you're working for the biggest reg- wrestling company ever, in my opinion. So it, it's a whole different thing and a whole different set of uh, pressure. And, you know, like I said, you know, they they might want us to do something small and I always would try to pitch something bigger as far as our involvement or the bump or something like that. So, yeah, you always want to do better. But I I can't say that I'd never wanted to do better at TNA. But like I say, it's just a I guess it's just a a bigger company and more more pressure, more people, uh, that type of thing. And, And the guys. I didn't have a role in WWF where I was a threat to anybody. So I can't really say, you know, you don't get involved in a whole bunch of stuff when you're not a threat. Right. Right. That makes so, sense. That makes sense. Um, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's a big difference for me. Yeah. 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 Did you feel like you had a little more say in TNA than, than WWF? Obviously. Oh, oh, oh. 
absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for that question. And this third one, I think is, I I don't know that it's really a wolfy question, but honestly, I think you were one guy that can answer this easily. So it's at baby duck Casper on YouTube. And he asked this question. He says, is Sin Bodhi anything like his character outside of wrestling? (laughs) (laughs) He is his character outside of wrestling. (laughs) He's the warlord of weird, man. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, he's he, uh, living out in the outskirts of Vegas, raising chickens and shit. And yeah, making yeah. figures and you know all his the shows. That, I, I don't think he runs them anymore, but the you know the man had a an octopus under his ring that would that would get people. Yeah, that's <laughs> so. Amazing. He he's a very creative, artistic dude, man, and it, it shines through his personality uh, and, and also in the ring. Yeah, yeah, great guy. I don't yeah. know him like you do. Absolutely not nowhere close. But man, hard to go, hard to go. yeah, yeah. When I was putting the Wolfie D birthday episode together, and I sent that mass texts out to everyone, he was one of the first to reply and say, yeah. "Hell yes, give me a call. Let's yeah. make this." You know, so him awesome. and like Doctor Tom, and then Jerry Calhoun, and yeah. you know, it kind of shows you the guys that like, okay, I'm gonna drop everything right now and do this <laughs> for Wolfie. You know, that's, so. That's- Nice. Yeah, so Sin is that guy, and and that yeah. should say. And then he made you an incredible slash action figure, which honestly, yeah. that's a shame that figure isn't for mass consumption because that, uh, yeah, that that's that's a cool figure. We need to we need to do that somehow. I know we've both been searching it high and low for action figure makers to make something. So, but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> yeah, it is, man. It yeah, is, unfortunately. Yeah, but Sin's a cool guy. Definitely appreciated him when he came on we need to get him back on sometime he was a he was a good interview and yeah cool dude and i I don't think you could be him and not be him all the time you know (laughs) yeah he's no (laughs) he's no half stepper he doesn't know he goes all in yeah he's all in or or nothing at all and i you gotta respect that i mean that's living the gimmick right there living the gimmick 101 Mm -hmm. (laughs) yes sir (laughs) yeah well brother that is all i got for today on this very special mark lawrence episode that was a a good episode i thought Uh, yeah i had fun with that like i said i like seeing the different perspectives and that's one that haven't really gotten to uh you know jump into so and, yes. and hopefully everybody else uh enjoyed that too being able to see yeah. it from a different perspective definitely so uh yeah we got one more um coming up next week we'll just we'll kayfabe for a minute but sure. it is uh, another uh, captain nick uh, captain's corner um person for the show yes. that he's doing in orlando right uh, so yeah we'll, we'll have another cool one next week guys so tune in check us out thank you for your support and don't forget we're on youtube now uh with new content and uh brand new shows drop every money just like on apple and spotify and everywhere else so again we appreciate your uh, support subscribe 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 and now a word from our sponsor Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling, the podcast that's based on the old school, but can still help you find the good stuff from today. Jimmy Street and the Plastic Sheik, Jared, are the undisputed tag team champions of the wrestling podcast world. From thought-provoking topics to superstar interviews to action figure expertise, this team does it all, and all they ask is, Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling! Every other Thursday, wherever you listen to podcasts. Join me, Gene Jackson, for the Jackson Interaction Podcast, where I'll be doing one-on-one interviews with people from the world of professional wrestling, as well as stand-up comedy. You can get them anywhere podcasts are available in both video and audio form, but you can find them all at GeneJacksonPod.com. That's right, it's the Talk of Middle Tennessee, the channel you love to hate and the channel you hate to love. It's Brian Turner from Brian Turner's VHS Rehab. And if you're looking for matches from Wolfie D to Jerry Lawler to Dusty Rhodes, 
and the team that put a pimp before your eyes and a goatee between your thighs, Booty Call and Athena, go to LostWrestling.com. See, I made it easy for you. Brian Turner's VHS Rehab. Booyah. So that was another great episode. Hey, Wolfie, tell them where they can find you on social media. Jimmy, they can find me in the club, bottle full of bub. I'm just kidding. Uh, they can find me on Facebook. Uh, my personal page is Warren Wolf, W-O-L-F-E. I'm on Instagram, at Warren Wolf 13. You can always find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, at Live Wolfie D. Here's the thing. Wolfie always has offers for his autographed photos. He has a selection of some awesome photos from throughout his career that he will autograph and personalize any way that you want him to. Just contact him either directly at his personal Facebook page or through any one of our other pages, and we'll make sure you get in contact directly with Wolfie. Get those photos, right, Wolfie? Yeah, I've got some good stuff on there, you know, to help with the podcast. Folks, if you can't get out to a show to meet Wolfie D, there's nothing like that, especially for the fans of PG-13 and Wolfie D. And before we go, you can always find me, your host, Jimmy Street, at James Rock Street on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And hey, Jimmy, before we go real quick, I just want to add in there, uh, from the bottom of my heart, I really appreciate First of all, the work you've done for this podcast. You have worked your butt off. Secondly, the people that are liking the page. Beyond that, even more, is the people that are listening. And we really appreciate that. Yeah, and remember, guys, the podcast drops a new episode every Monday at noon. And our past episodes are streaming now on demand on all major podcast formats. Thanks again. I got a cat for you don't. He got a cat for you don't. I got a cat for you don't. He got a cat for you don't. He got a cat for you don't. And here we go. The original white boy that came out sagging, not bragging, don't be hating, cause I'm spitting the truth. Still lobbing in color. Don't rush your mother. Utilize a hubcap. I'm like any other. Back in the day, I was NOD. And I was P to the G plus the one and the three. In case you forgot, they call me Wolfie D. Been cloned and copied so many times. Tired of suckers taking credit for what is mine. You know who you are without me name dropping wrestling's first white boy coming out hip hop. Been doing it like this since 92. Laid low for a while when you thought I was free. Listen real close to these rhymes that I've injected. This shit's so sick it makes your ears get infected. Mad skills, no faking, there is no one great. Cause I'm bringing more folks and over one for later. Not here to play games, so you better be right. You don't like me, so what? I really don't, don't care. care. Like time I keep ticking and I can't be stopped. You suck a step to the side unless you want to get dropped. When my finish, I'll straight knock you out. Please allow me to tell you what it's all about. Gonna wind it up. And I'm driving it home, it's Wolfie D, baby. Huh, I got a cap for your dome. I got a cap for your dome. We got a cap for your dome. We got a cap for your dome. This has been a James Rock Street production.